appeal to extremes. And this kind of ties into reducing things to their absurd level, uh, which is a good thing sometimes and sometimes a bad thing. Just be careful as you hear it used. So an example would be if I said, the more water you drink, the healthier you will be. Well, if we take that kind of how I meant it, and I'm suggesting perhaps eight glasses of water a day instead of one glass of Coke, then it's very true and valid. If, however, you said, yeah, but wait, look at the people who were on the Titanic. They sure drank a lot, and it didn't make them healthier. Yep, you're absolutely right. That's taking it to the absurd. I need to go back and say, hey, good point, my conversation partner pal. Thanks for catching that. I'm going to change what I said to up to a gallon a day. It's a good idea to drink more water than less. And you could probably even come up with a way to help me refine my language even more. And that is kind of what logical fallacies encourage us to do. When we hear them or when we catch ourselves using them, let's tighten up our language. Let's choose the words we use carefully. And it's not the end of the world if we mess this up, but uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely worth watching. So when somebody says that, you know, there's, there's a homeless guy beside the freeway and uh, he got 20 bucks from two cars in a row. And then you said, well, he, he's probably the richest guy in the world because if 50 cars go by him in an hour, 50 times 20 bucks is a thousand dollars. This guy's making a thousand dollars an hour in one day. That's $24,000. Like he's making more than attorneys or doctors or, wow, homeless people by the freeway must be wealthy. Well, no, that's just, that's reducing it to its absolute absurd. It's not a good, honest way to communicate logically and with reason.